Has it, really, I would like to, you know, I'd like to just thank you all for your faithfulness to the church. I mean, really, I love it. I, I'm so, uh, we're, I'm, I'm really blessed uh, to be the pastor of the church, and I am really just, I, I, I don't know what I can do to express your faithfulness. I, I appreciate this so much. I mean, really, uh, I, I, how many miles is it to drive from there to here? 45, 50 minute drive. Uh, how from Edgewater? Roughly 40. I guess 30. Not that we're in competition. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually about 30. If he drives his sports car, it's 40 minutes. <laughs> <clears throat> but no, I mean, think of the faithfulness, though. I mean, really, how, how beautiful is this? Yes. It is beautiful. And you know, uh, like I'm looking today. There's 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 a there's an empty road there, um, and you know there there are people who wanted to be here, you know there are people who wanted to be here who just didn't feel it this morning. They 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 maybe they were sick, and uh, as we had prayed earlier, there may be people who aren't here because maybe their hearts aren't right with the Lord, or maybe they're still grieving the loss of a loved one, or or whatever the case is. But but I will say that. Um, there, there came a point in my life to whenever I had to make a, a, uh, an effort to say this is priority, you know. And, and not only that, there are people out there who aren't as disciplined. There are just people out there who just aren't disciplined enough to just get up and get ready. And so people are at different spots. Um, and I'll tell you, our, our God knows us. And he knows that if we really valued something, you couldn't stop us from getting there. Amen. You know? and, and I think it's a testament to God whenever you make it here. When you come here, again, you don't come here because, uh, or you shouldn't really, you shouldn't come here because you would feel guilty if you didn't come. Maybe the you'd be, oh, well, the pastor knows I missed it. No, we come here because we want Jesus to be happy. Amen. We come here because, man, for what He's done for us, we just can't wait to express our thankfulness. Amen. And I'm looking at a couple of uh, two different revivals in the Bible. And I'm going to present those to us today. Two revivals that happened. And it's, it's amazing to think God showed up simply because a few ministers decided that they would tell the people what God says. That's all they did, is they told the people what God says. And the people were hungry. They were hungry for the truth. They were hungry for God. Something happened to me this past week, and it's been happening for quite some time, but it, it is a spirit of discouragement. Maybe you guys are lucky. Maybe you don't have any discouragement at all in your life. But there is a spirit, there is a spirit of discouragement that tries, I know, to discourage you from being faithful to Jesus. But there's also one that's falling upon me uh, uh, of discouragement. And what, what, what led me to that feeling of discouragement was I was speaking to some people who felt in their heart that they truly were illuminated and they truly knew what God's Word said. They thought they knew. They thought they knew. And they would tell me some things. Oh, the Bible says this. Oh, the Bible says this. Or, I believe this because that's what God word, God's Word says. And when I listened to them, I thought to myself, and I asked them, I said, are you, did, are you reading, the, are you reading the, the Holy Bible? The Holy Bible? Oh, yes. And I thought to myself, that they are either completely blind, they have no discernment or understanding 
Or like my brother, I call him, and I typically don't call him, he's a Southern Baptist, so <laughs> you might not want to get a lot of advice from him. So. <laughs> and I called him and I said, can you believe this? Can you believe some of the things that these people were telling me that they, they thought, you know, God was, uh, God, and he says, Jason, there's a Bible verse that says, let any among you who wishes to be ignorant, let them continue to be ignorant. You know, so, I was like, yeah, I guess they're just, they don't know. People think they know the Bible, but they don't. And it's true, I think uh, Kirk was telling me, I believe on Friday, when he was younger, he went to a church, uh, let's say younger, maybe 14 years old, he went to the church, and when he went to the church, he says, what do you people believe? And they said, we just believe the Bible. So he said, well, great, this is a good church for me. <laughs> but then he found out that they, what, well, that, that, that some of the things that they were saying and reading and then their interpretation of the Bible, it was completely off. And so they, he thought, well, they said they believe the Bible, but they, they preach from the Bible, but what they're saying isn't from the Bible. So he's like, well, maybe I'm just at the wrong church. So he went to another church. And he walked in and he said, they said, he said what do you believe? Oh, we believe the Bible. He said, but, but what do you preach? They said, oh, we just preach from the Bible. And then they started preaching this crazy doctrine that wasn't even in the Bible. And so finally the third church he went to and he says, all right, I've been to two other churches. I'm trying to find a church to go to. What church? What, what do you believe? Guess what they said? The Bible. We believe the Bible. And he says, no, you don't. <laughs> And they said, what? He said, everybody says that. You see, it is true, isn't it? A lot of Christian churches, everybody says that. Everybody says Everybody. But I think, I think it was maybe John or, I'm not giving you a whole lot of credit, John, but I'll give you a little. <laughs> There's a difference between saying that you study the Bible and rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, rightly dividing the word of truth totally but I mean reading it taking it for what it says in the context that it's saying it and letting that saturate and become a part of your identity you see that that's what we've got to have and I think that's the problem with churches today they all say, oh, we're from, we, we preach the Bible, or we teach the Bible, but then they spin the Bible, and they twist the Bible, just like the devil does. And now, that leaves us in a really difficult situation. In America, it's unbelievable. Because you can go to a church, and no joke, if you really wanted to go to a particular church that wanted to, and you, you know, you know the the, the gross sins of today, we can find a church to pretty much satisfy whatever worldly desire you wish to live. Right. We can find a church that you would, you know, that, that would fit you perfectly. But the idea is the churches and the ministers and the leaders in the church need to wake up and realize this: that the church isn't necessarily here to cater to the people. The church is here to bring glory to Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, you may not like some of the things that we're preaching from here in the Bible. You may not like the subject matter. You may not like that. But the deal is, is this is to bring glory and honor to Jesus. Amen. You see? And you get an opportunity to witness a minister Bring glory and honor to Jesus every Sunday. And you, just, and you should crave that, right? Yes. You should want that. You should get to the point to where you want more. You want more. And the, how do we get there? How do we get more? How about just beg God? People are like, oh, I don't know. Begging sounds pretty bad. Are you too proud to beg? No. There's been times in my life to when I needed Jesus and I needed more of Him. And maybe He was giving me a lot, 
But I still wanted more. Amen. I mean, he wants us to want it more. He does. As a mother or uh, someone who has a parent's heart, um, don't you love it when your children want you? Yes. Don't you love it when they just want you, when they just want to spend time with you? I mean, I love it. And typically that doesn't happen with me. My children will walk in and if they're crying and then my heart's broken for them and they're walking right towards me and I finally get all broken hearted too with compassion and I reach my hands out to give them a hug and they totally walk right past me and go straight to mom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how is that? And I'm thinking, but I'm your father. The one who loves you. You totally just... And they just didn't even recognize me. They went straight to the mother. <laughs> and sad thing is, is people in the world today, they need compassion. They need someone to hold them. They need someone to tell them everything is okay. And as they're walking down the road looking for affirmation and looking for someone to console them and someone to hold them and comfort them as they're walking this road looking for that Jesus is there with his arms wide open saying I'm ready for you and people just walk right past him and go straight to the world mm. they walk right past him and go straight to the world and lets the world comfort them they're walking right by God the Father they're walking right by God and that's what happened in the Old Testament to this one particular uh, country. And we talked about it before, the Ninevites, or this city, the Ninevites. And I'll just, just we're going to look at this passage briefly because it's very small. And it's Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3 because this was a horrible, horrible, horrible nation. It was a horrible city. They deserved punishment. They had gotten to the point to where their sin was so gross that God says enough, people. And we've talked about this in a, a few weeks ago, didn't we? How that America looks like they're on that same path. The whole world looks like they're on that same path. And, and, and you know, I'm pretty harsh towards the sins of America because I'm living in America. But I can guarantee you based upon the way I believe that other countries are living that this should be an international uh, message. Everyone in the world needs to wake up because the world now is being deceived by Satan himself. That's right. And the people now in this world are looking for other comforts other than God. And they had better wake up. Amen. Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city. I want you to look at this thing. It calls Nineveh what? A great city. In Revelation, it calls Babylon the great a great city. And God is going to destroy Babylon in the end days, in the end times. Amen. It doesn't matter if you have a great country, a great city. It doesn't matter if you have the best riches. It doesn't matter if you have the best military. It doesn't matter if you commit such gross sins to where God has to send punishment. He will, and it will be devastating. He says, Arise and go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. I love this, and every minister, he ministers in training, and I'm sure all of those big name TV evangelists right now are watching our YouTube, or watching our Facebook, and I'm talking to you people too, alright? You people who are watching, I'm sure that they're watching, right? They need to wake up and say, I am willing to to tell the truth no matter if they like it or not. Amen. And I'm willing to tell the truth even if it doesn't line my pockets with money. That's right. Even if it sends me straight to the poorhouse, even if it sends 
What is it called? Persecution. Be willing to tell the truth about God. Be willing to tell what thus saith the Lord. It says, uh, verse 3, So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days journey. Verse 4, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He's walking in and saying, People, destruction is coming. You only have 40 days to prepare. You guys are going down. Interesting. <coughs> Verse 5. So the people of Nineveh, they what? They believe Jonah? They believe God. The people believe God. They listen to Jonah. Jonah was announcing what the Lord said. The people believed what the Lord said. And the people believed God. And they proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth. From the greatest of them even to the least of them. That means it doesn't matter if this person was the mayor. It didn't matter if he was the senator. It didn't matter if he was the the leader, the king, it didn't matter if he was the richest or the poorest. All the people did what? They came, they proclaimed a fast. They said, we need to connect with God. We need to stop letting our appetites be full. Think of it. The people had gotten to the point to where they were not eating to live. They were living to eat. They just loved good food. And I understand I like good food too. Give me bad food to eat and I will fast. <laughs> but the idea was is they were letting their appetite lead them. They said, forget it. We now are going to, we have to focus, we have to focus on the destruction that's at hand because of our sins. You see? We have to understand, and that's what, so they said we are going to fast. They said we're going to fast and we're going to put on sackcloth, meaning that we are not going to parade around showing everybody how good we are. We're not putting on a fashion show today, people. We're putting on sackcloth because we are a miserable group of people. We might as well go ahead and dress like it. That's what that means. <laughs> we're miserable. We definitely have earned a, a, a nice good whipping here. And so now we're going to fast. We're going to put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. Verse 6. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered himself with sackcloth and ashes. He's, I mean, he's repentant. He's like, I don't even deserve to wear the riches that we've got. We're all going down, people. That's what it is. God said that He's going to take us out. We're all going down. Verse 7. And He caused it to be, be proclaimed. This is the king. And published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink. Let me tell you something that nobody, nobody gives credit to. And that is the king of Nineveh. I give this guy some super props. Have you ever heard anybody, anybody preach that the king of Nineveh, what a great leader? Ladies and gentlemen, this was a great leader. He heard the word of God. He repented and told all the people in the country, you guys fast and pray and repent for your sins. Wouldn't it be great if one of our politicians got in front of the camera and said, America, repent of your sins. Punishment is coming. Give your heart to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Right? Could you imagine that? Right. Could you just imagine that? 
Man, oh man, think about it. The people would just, what would you do if you heard a politician do that? You know what I do? I do exactly what he says. I get on my hands and knees and repent and give my life to Christ. That's what needs to happen, people. Amen. It needs to happen in every state, every every county, every in the, the, the country. It needs to happen in the world. Is it going to happen? More than likely not, because the people are so selfish. They don't care. think about it. People are so selfish and consumed with their own money and their own position. Do you think some of these politicians are going to take off their nice clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and look miserable? Do you think that's going to happen? I don't think so. Because they're too proud. They've earned this spot. They're representatives. Representatives of who? Yourself? Right. If you're a representative of God Almighty, you're going to tell everybody, this is your only hope, people. Because our country has gotten to the point, our world has gotten to the point to where God is ready to just throw down. Right. And he says what? Again, what a leader. Verse 7 again. And he calls it to be proclaimed in public. <laughs> Ladies, look, I don't watch a whole lot of news, but listen. How many of these executive orders do you see these presidents given? Oh, executive order, I'm going to do this. Executive order, I'm going to do that. Executive order, I'm going to do this. How about an executive order to, to, to again... Bow down to God and begging for forgiveness. Amen. You see, you sign an executive order, will you? And then go ahead and ask Congress to go ahead and send that all the way to the Supreme Court. Is that legal? Amen. Well, just give it two or three years, you'll be voted out anyway. Right. But make it an executive order, somebody. Will Amen. somebody please write a letter to the president, please, for me? Put urgent on it. Christ Wesleyan Church, urgent. See if that will persuade them. I'm not saying that uh, I'm not saying that it will do anything, but that's what the Lord wants. I guarantee you that's what Jesus would want. If you're going to be a leader, then you need to again tell the truth. So he tells them to do it says a decree, uh, it says public student in uh, uh, verse 7, right? I haven't got, I've been working on verse 7 for five minutes, haven't I? And he calls it to be proclaimed and published in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink. Verse 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. I want you people to beg God. I want you to cry to the Lord. I want you again to pray. I want you people to look towards God. Ladies and gentlemen, who's telling the world, who's telling America that judgment's coming? Jonah here said judgment's coming. And the king turned and said this. So again, uh, and cry mightily unto God, yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hand. Unbelievable, people! And it's so quiet. I know I'm excited and you guys aren't excited, but I'm just saying, maybe you should... I, I, I get at the house and I'm just getting, I'm getting these shouting fits in my head. Imagine why I've got a headache all the time. I'm just shouting. You walk over to my house and what's Dad doing? Well, he's shouting real quiet. <laughs> no joke. Let me just tell you this. I, there are people that make fun of preachers like this. They call them Bible thumpers. They call them pulpit pounders. Old-fashioned, fundamental preachers. I don't care. I, I really don't care. But I'll tell you what, if America really wants to hear the truth, they can tune right in and I'm just going to shout it, shout it from the rooftops. Listen, listen, Jonah 
Again, verse 4, chapter 3, verse 4. And Jonah began to enter the city a day's journey, and he cried. He screamed to the top of his lungs, saying, yet 40 days and you're going to be overthrown. He's crying it out. He's telling the people, judgment's coming, people. And but they took the word of God serious. I'll tell you, most of these churches are more concerned with making sure that the people are happy and that they like their little church club. We can't say anything that will turn them away. What happens if we discourage them or what happens if we make them think, well, well I don't know if I really like somebody telling me what thus saith the Lord. Let me tell you, he told the truth and they all turned towards the Lord. Verse 8, I'm going to read it again. But let man and beast be covered with... I like that too, man and beast, right? Even the animals. Everybody's repenting today, people. I don't care if you got a dog, man. You a, we're repenting. We, all, we, we need everybody. Everybody's giving their heart to Jesus in this house. He said, every man and beast. He's like... Uh, let them be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fiercest, fierce anger that we perish not? He's like, you don't know. You don't know. You don't know. If we beg God enough, if we cry enough, if we just beg, if we, if we get low enough and we humble ourselves enough, God might just say, I'll give you another shit chance. I'll let you live. Let me tell you right now, my girl is how old? Nine years old? Nine years old. She has mastered, mastered how to beg for another chance. <laughs> <laughs> you might not know her like I know her, but she has mastered it. She has mastered it. Even if she fails over and over and over and over again, she'll try every which way. The wisdom of a nine-year-old. We as adults can learn from that. But the wisdom from a nine-year-old, and she will try to do whatever it takes, even if, and it's like she will write love letters <laughs> with hearts. She'll write these love letters. But Dad, I I know I deserve to be punished. <laughs> But please, and whenever whenever she writes, Father, you say, it's not Dad anymore, it's Father. When she writes that, guess, you know, you can you can sense she truly, truly means business here. She wants, she wants so desperately for me to show her compassion and forgiveness. And you know what? She reminds me, because we all know this, it's it's Dad the Merciful. She reminds me, but Dad, you're Dad the Merciful. <laughs> no joke. No joke. That's our God too. Our God is God the Merciful. Who knows? And they're saying, who knows? Even though the proclamation was, we're dirty, evil, rotten sinners. We deserve to be punished. He's going to wipe us all out. But you know what? Even if begging the Lord is wrong, I don't want to be right, right? So I'm just going to beg God, and I'm just going to tell Him how sorry I am. I'm going to repent and turn from my ways. And I'm even going to show Him how serious I am that I'm even going to put... I mean, I'm going to put sackcloth on my farm animals. I want him to know how serious I am about letting him be my God. Amen. And yes, and he says, I mean this. And so he says again, I'm going to read verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And one of the greatest verses in all of Scripture Verse 10. 
And God saw their, their works. So a lot of times people say, there is nothing good that I could ever do. I am, I am incapable of doing anything good. You know what? This is amazing. And God saw their works. That they turned from their evil way. And God, and God repented of the evil that He would have said. That He would do unto them. And He did it not. That means that God changed His mind. Amen. Can you believe it? That these people, they meant it. They meant business. They, they just said, no. Just imagine though how they felt whenever God decided, I'm not killing all of you. I'm not killing you and your whole family and your kids. Just imagine what they thought. You know what? Chances are they were thinking this. Praise the Lord for the minister who came in here into our city, even though it wasn't the greatest city, but praise the Lord for the minister who came in here and told us the truth. Amen. And told us the truth. And said, evil is evil and is going to be punished and you guys have finally pushed God to the limit. Praise the Lord for that minister. And I can just imagine, what do you say? What do you say 20 years from, from then? What do you say to your kids? You know, guys, we're very fortunate. They're probably saying, why do we have to go to Sunday school? Because we have to go because we honor this God who should have taken your dad out years ago Amen. because of the way I was acting. But He showed compassion. And He showed us such grace and mercy. And that's why we're going, people. We're going because we love Him. We're going because He loves us. Amen. We're going because this is the God of mercy. This is the God we serve. Then 20 years down the road, those kids have kids. And they're going to church. Why do we have to go to church? Because we love God. Amen. And they kept telling their kids and telling their kids and telling their kids for a hundred years. And we know the story. After about a hundred years, they stopped doing it. Well, I think that's where the world's at, don't you? And so, just uh, one more set of Scripture before we close here. And that is in the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. What a, what a revival, huh? Right. This is more than a revival. Salvation came. Amen? Amen. Good. Oh, man. Ne Nehemiah. Somebody. Can I get a witness in the house? Alright. Alright, first one to find Nehemiah, could you come up and help me, please? Oh, yeah, thank you. Oh, man, yeah, I'll never forget that. Alright, I can't find it, so I'll just tell you what I'll memorize. Hold on a second, I'm, I'm still flipping. My bad. Try the 800s. <laughs> it's five, page 555. Five, five, five. All right. Nehemiah. Oh, man. Go get me that ladder, Jason. Give me that ladder. Bring it over here. Little ladder. I told you I was going to get up on the ladder. The insurance paid up. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 8. Go ahead, son. Bring it on. Bring it on. Give us your Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to get on a ladder tall in this, people. I might not even get on it. I'm just going to put it here. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 8. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street. I like that. All the people came out. They gathered around the street that was before the water gate, and they spoke unto Ezra, Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. So think of it the people came to the priest, 
The people came to the scribe. The people came to the man of God. And the people asked him to bring the Bible. Now, I would love for you people at some point to get so hungry for the Word of God that you say, I want to have a whole other service. I want some more preaching. Amen. I want to hear more Amen. preaching. I can't get enough. That's what happened. These people, they went to the preacher and said, would you go get your Bible, please? Does that happen nowadays? No. no. Listen, a successful church now, and they will tell you this right now at seminary, a successful church is a 15-minute sermon because the people don't want to sit and listen to the Word of God. They want, they want to listen to music. They want to be listening to music. They want to have a good experience. And listen, experience in 15 minutes, 20 tops, and you're done. That's what they're teaching them. Because the pe and they'll say, because the people's attention span can't last that long. Listen, do you think my attention span can last more than three minutes? I don't think so. That's why I've got the Bible, so I can get back on track. Listen, these people said, go get your Bible. Verse 2. And Ezra, Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all who could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. That means that the women came, the men came, and the kids came. It, listen, and here's something else. We all know this. Those kids that are back there right now, they're learning about Jesus. Amen. They're learning about Jesus. But let me just tell you right now that we should not let our kids go without hearing and being taught the Word of God. Amen. And these people who had understanding, they were being taught the Word of God. They, so he brought the Bible out in front of everybody. Verse 3, and he read from it. It says... Uh, he read from it before the street that was before the water gate from morning until midday. midday. Think of this. From morning till midday. Morning to me is 8 o'clock in the morning. How about next week? We have church at 8 o'clock. Who will be here? Amen. Right, three? <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. Because you know, from morning till noon, he's up reading the Bible, and the people are down there, and you're thinking, I'm sure that they're bored stiff because he's just reading the Bible. Where's the praise and worship group? Where's the band? Where's the concession stand? Where's the slurpee out in the church foyer? He reads it from morning to midday before the men and the women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. That means they were paying attention, people. They weren't fiddling around, texting on Facebook. They weren't all doing all this other stuff. They didn't have a laptop. They didn't go back in the restroom and, send it and text somebody on their cell phone. They were attentive. They were listening. They wanted to hear more preaching. <sighs> <laughs> I mean, does it, oh, it makes me want to cry. I can't believe it. Could you just imagine? I mean, you can't imagine because you're not the preacher. <laughs> but I just couldn't imagine. I mean, it would absolutely just, I mean, I could, I, 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 I'd be here. You come and tell me that you're going to drive here to listen to more preaching, we're giving it. And if I can't give it, I'm going to have somebody else up here and we'll just take turns. Like those old Free will Baptist churches. The guy get up, he preached for an hour, and he'd ask the brother such and such, come on up, he preached for another hour. Sometimes when we were in church for six hours, they just take turns. He's up there reading all day long. It says, verse 4, and Ezra, Ezra the scribe, stood upon a pulpit of wood. He stood on it. He's like, all right. He stood up. All right, everybody. Here's the word of the Lord. And he stood and he's reading. And as for the scribe stood up, uh, stood up on a pulpit of plastic, this bit of wood. 
It says, which they had made for the purpose. They're like, we want you to get up there so everybody can see you and hear what you're saying. And he says, and beside him stood this other guy, and this other guy, and this other guy, and the other guy, and the other guy, and the other guy. On his right hand and on his left hand was this other guy, and this other guy, and this other guy, and this other guy. Meaning, and would you like to read those names? And the other, it's like, so everybody goes up and they're all standing up there too. They're excited to hear what? What's he doing? He's just reading the Bible. He's just reading the Bible. And the people, he's just reading the Bible. And Ezra opened the book for the, in the sight of all the people. For he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And they were so excited, they gave reverence. They gave reverence. It's so sad that you go to a ball game and they're like, Would you please stand as we sing the national anthem? And some people are just kneeling down. No, stand up and give God the reverence. This is the word of God, people. This is the most important thing you can ever hear. Amen? Amen. And he's up there and he's reading and the people stood up and Ezra blessed the Lord. Now think about it. What's he doing? He's preaching the word of God and it brought God a blessing. Think of it. We all pray what? That God will bless us, don't we? Oh, bless us, Lord. Oh, bless us. Oh, bless us. Have you been blessing the Lord lately? I'm telling you, if you preach the Word of God, it'll make Him happy. You see, it blessed the Lord. God looked down and says, Oh, Ezra, and the people, you're making me so happy. And it made them happy. And it says, And Ezra opened the book and sang all the people, and he stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord the great God. And all the people answered, Amen. 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 Say that in a Presbyterian church. They might usher you out. Because they're like, us. we're the frozen chosen. Shh. Amen. Amen. Lifting up their hands. Praise the Lord. And worship the Lord with their faces on the ground. People, they took Jesus. They took God seriously. We can't get people to take God serious now, can we? No. And the idea is this. Who was center of attention? The Word of God. The Word of God. And it says, verse, uh, verse, verse 7, verse 8, because there's a lot there that I, I'm having trouble with. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. That meant, guess what? If people were there and they didn't understand what he was reading, they sent people out into the audience to go and help them understand. Because they cared. Oh, man. Praise the Lord. God sent revival. And all it took was a preacher who was willing to preach the Word. Amen. And I'll tell you, we have that luxury here. We have that opportunity. And you people, revival can't happen if you don't come. Revival can't happen if you don't put the Word of God first. There is calamity coming upon this world. God is going to send His judgment upon this world. If He does not send judgment within the next couple of years, or the next at least three or four years, I will be pleasantly surprised. Amen. Or unpleasantly surprised, because I'm telling you, I'm heavenward bound. Yes. <clears throat> but I'll t I think the world has finally pushed the limit. I think they've crossed the line. I think there's no turning back now. If we don't have leaders like the king of Nineveh to stand up and tell the people if we don't repent, God's going to just punish the earth right before your eyes. That's right. We very well may see it happen. That's right. That's right. And so we have got to, again, as the rest of the world continues to keep living their way, we're going to keep living our way, which is God's way. Amen? Amen. So I'm telling you now, Again, we could have revival. We could have revival. It might not be 150 people in this church, but it could be us. Amen. It could be us. I want more of that old-fashioned just feeling in my heart, don't you? Amen. I want God to just make 
me be willing to just go to the... I, I want Him. I want so much of God, and I want to know and experience Him so much, I'd be willing to ride my bike here. Amen. I'll walk. I'd almost be willing to walk. No, I'd be willing to walk. Amen. From Sanford? Amen. Amen. Would you be willing to walk? I would. Amen. What happens if all the gas stations close down? We'd be walking. Walk. I'm in the streets. Yeah. There's going to be church going on here, people. I'm telling you, if I should fall, they got a key. If they should fall, they got a key. They got a key. Keep it going. Keep it going. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand if we would, please. <laughs>